this this is very different. Um, I, I'm, I'm still getting used to this new system. Scott, Kerry, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome everyone to another installment of MSP webinars. We're going to talk about sales and marketing today. And for some strange reason, I put it backwards in the title of the webinar. So it's marketing and sales apparently. Um, I would like to introduce our two awesome panelists and then we're just gonna kind of dive right into it. Um, everyone that's attending, uh, you should be able to hear and see us. And there is a chat feature. Oh, where is that for you guys? In the top uh, top right, there should be a, a little like speech bubble looking button. And uh, yeah, I think we'll I think we're good to go. So I will uh, do this ladies first. Carrie, uh, Carrie is with Managed Sales Pros, and I'm gonna just let you tell your story because you can do it better than I. All right. Well, I want to say four years ago I was doing consulting for enterprise level software companies and some other small businesses locally to me, which is Winnipeg, Canada. And we were working with a marketing firm in Winnipeg and we got a referral to uh, a managed service provider in Winnipeg. So the MSP called me and said, hey, can you do this? And I was like, yeah, of course we can do that. And then I Googled managed services and the rest is history. So, I mean, really the principles of cold calling apply business to business from industry to industry. There isn't a lot of difference in whether it's managed services or financial services or marketing services. Cold calling is pretty much cold calling. So we figured it out. We were referred to a bunch of people in their peer group and that's how we started building our business. We went from being a uh, non niche specific cold calling firm. So my company before managed sales pros was called cold calls. Pretty much described what we did and managed sales pros was spun off into a niche practice. And now all we do is support MSP IT firms and the vendors that want to interact with them. Uh, and our other panelist today is Scott Zimmerman. Scott, you do all kinds of cool things. I know one of the things I feel like you're known for is you're the co-author of the Platinum Rule. And you've also, my bad. Actually, that's the Platinum Rule for Sales Mastery was one book. No, that's okay. Dr. Alessandra and Dr. Okay. O'Connor wrote the original Platinum Rule back in 1996. And I came along about 10 years later and took their concept and we wrote a book on the sales process. We wrote the platinum rule for small business mastery. And then we also wrote the platinum rule for trade show mastery. So we had three spinoffs of one great concept of the awesome. platinum rule. And, which and I'll I talk know you've, a little you've bit been about involved later. in uh, sales and marketing for quite some time. What, what other things have you, have you been up to over the years? Well, I've been very blessed when I started my business. I hate to date myself, but I can't get away from it. Back in 1989, um, we were a graphic design communications advertising firm, and we kept evolving over time. And back in the late 90s, we uh, were doing brochures and ad specialties and helping our clients with traditional B2B marketing. And I discovered that a lot of them wanted things to go to trade shows. So they wanted brochures and tchotchkes. And just out of curiosity, I asked them about the length of their sales cycle. And I asked them, well, if your sales cycle is 18 to 24 months, where are your leads from the trade show two years ago? And they just kind of stared at me like a dog looking at a ceiling fan. And I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it make sense to nurture those leads throughout the life of the sales cycle? And being allergic to money, I went ahead and invented software to automate <laughs> all of the lead nurturing for salespeople because as I studied them, I realized that they would only pick the low hanging fruit and they had no interest in staying in touch with somebody for two or three years. So we invented a system originally called Cyrano for Cyrano de Bergerac that would send the love letters from, you know, from Christian to Roxanne. Nobody got the name. So I renamed it sales <laughs> elevator recently so Very people cool. could pronounce it and spell it. So um, <laughs> we, we are going to talk marketing and sales today. And, and our focus obviously is managed services, uh, hence MSP webinars, right? So I, I'm gonna, first, I just wanna make sure that everyone here knows, um, if you have questions, uh, don't wait. We're not doing like a Q and A at the end. This whole thing is a conversation and the whole thing is a Q and A, okay? So I'm gonna start by saying, 
Um, to both of you, how how do you start? Like, where do you begin? Is this is this like the chicken and the egg? I mean, can you have sales without marketing? Can you have marketing without people to sell to? Does that make sense? Uh, being being raised properly, I'll <laughs> deflect to the lady first and. Thank you. <laughs> I think if you're going to look at sales and marketing independently of each other, you're doing your business a disservice. They have to feed into each other. So as far as where do you start, you start where you are the most competent and you start where you are going to spend the least amount of money. In, in my opinion, like when we started our business, we did what we could afford and we did as much of that as possible. So, I mean, it's all well and good to say, oh, you need to do this. But if you can't afford to do that, then it's a pipe dream for you. So what can you do right now? Whether it's a sales activity or a marketing activity, can you do email marketing? It's pretty inexpensive. Can you do your own outbound calling? That's also very inexpensive. If you're just starting your business, you have to apply both of those things to your business. You don't really get to choose one or the other. You have to figure them both out. Would you agree? I would agree wholeheartedly. And just to add a little bit to what you said, I, I guess in my view is marketing can be looked at twofold. Marketing can create awareness of a product or service to create an opportunity for a salesperson to share more knowledge and help that person make a good buying decision. If no one knows that you don't exist, there's no selling opportunity. Conversely, salespeople can go out and do things on their own to create the opportunities for themselves. So I think if everybody in the business takes responsibility, I think everybody in a company is a salesperson in one way, shape or form. And I think everybody in the company can help with marketing in one way, shape or form. I think that's a really good point. It's like one of the things that I want to drive home here is that everybody in your company is responsible for your brand, like for protecting your brand and your image and everything that people think about you in the market. So for those of you who are investing heavily in marketing and don't answer your phone when it rings, that's a huge issue, right? If you're going to spend money on pushing people to your website to inquire about your services and then you don't answer the phone or somebody picks up the phone and says, what? Or somebody picks up the phone, there's a dog barking in the background. A lot of you guys, and I know a lot of the attendees on here today, a lot of you guys are starting your businesses in your home and that's cool. That's where I started mine and I'm obviously working in my house today. But if you're pushing all that data back to your website and hoping that people are going to reach out to you, make sure that their first interaction with you is professional. Make sure that when you pick up the phone, you are always in business mode. If somebody's calling you and they want to trust you with a really important piece of their business and you sound like some guy in your basement with the dog barking and the kids and the this and the that, or worse yet, you're just not answering the phone at all, you're wasting any of the investment that you're making in your marketing. Well, I would add one tip that my mother, and you'll hear me speak about her quite a bit because she was a brilliant entrepreneur, but she said that if you are in any sales capacity whatsoever, regardless of your title, never have your call screen because just in case you might be away from your desk and someone calls and they ask for you and then they get the receptionist or someone comes back on and says, I'm sorry, he's not available. It makes that person feel small or less important. And it was just an honest mistake. So if you're in a sales capacity, I don't recommend having your call screen, just put them through. Yeah, I think that's a great, I mean, I still answer my own phone. I don't get very many calls though, which I find really interesting. How many calls? Is that a marketing challenge? <laughs> well, I, just, I think that it's interesting that people are aggressively defaulting to email marketing now. And one, it's really, it's inexpensive. And if you do it well, fantastic. But Everybody on this webinar, you are going to teach your client base to not open emails that they aren't expecting, right? You are teaching your client base right now to ignore any email that comes to them that might have something attached to it that might, so people aren't opening emails, right? Like you're teaching your clients not to do that. So when you're thinking about how you're going to interact with them, is email always the best option or is calling going to be the less cluttered way to the business decision maker at this point? Well, one, I'm just going to get the elephant in the room out of the way and, and quickly explain what the platinum rule is and why it applies to both sales and marketing. And the platinum rule is simply a more modern, sensitive version of the golden rule. 
So the golden rule says to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the platinum rule says do unto others as they want done unto or treat everybody the way each person wants to be treated. So when I make contact with someone for the first time, I always ask them how and how often would you like for me to communicate with you to where I'm in the right place at the right time. If they want email, they get email. If they want phone calls, they get phone calls. If they want visits, they get visits. So in part of my system is I'm capturing all the nuances on everyone that we communicate with so we can treat everybody the way each person wants to be treated. And the same thing all obviously would apply with both marketing and sales. So if someone wants email, if they want literature, if they want letters, that's what they get. And so we don't send things to people that they don't want, which creates to your point, attention erosion. Mm -hmm. So if you send things to people that's not relevant to what they want or what it is you're talking about, very soon you will train them to resent your name in their inbox and they'll stop reading everything you send them. So always make note on what people want and treat each person the way each person wants to be treated. And then back to your original point, that's what builds your personal brand mm -hmm. of someone who is good with people, someone who is thoughtful and goes out of your way to treat everybody the way each person likes to be treated. I think you've got to, like, first you've got to make that connection though, right? So mm -hmm. how do you do that at the beginning? Which is, I think, what most people are struggling with. What you've, Once you've got somebody, once you've engaged with them, once they're interacting with you, then you get to ask them, how do you prefer to be contacted? But first you have to get their attention. So what are, we don't do any email marketing at all here other than, like, we have a newsletter that we send out and you know, we do a little bit of cadence marketing based on that, but most of our outbound prospecting is done on the phone. What are you seeing from a from an email perspective, for example? Because you mentioned that the platform that you use it that you use creates those email interactions. What's your what's your hit rate like on initial email communication? We we never send an email to someone that has not already spoken to a human being. And ever. I thank you. Um, my whole mission in life was to eliminate spam and eliminate noise. Remember, I started as a business to business advertising marketing agency, and we were in the business of creating literature and flyers that were mailed to interrupt someone to try to get a message across. And I began noticing in the late nineties, no matter how well designed and how clever it was, it was almost impossible to interrupt a stranger and get them to take an action. And I shifted my whole focus from traditional advertising to person to person marketing. Uh, helping the salesperson build their brand through automating perfect follow-ups to demonstrate to the prospect that you're organized and a good listener and you're treating them the way they want to be treated. So if I were training a salesperson and they were trying to get into an account, I would say, well, let's go to work. And I would begin studying that company. I would try to use LinkedIn to learn about who the decision maker was and being a little bit clever I would call into the company and ask for sales. And I would talk to a salesperson. I'd say, hi, my name's Scott Zimmerman. I'm trying to get an appointment with John Smith and I don't know anything about him, but I'm pretty sure he's your boss. Can you help me out here? You'd be surprised how much information that they'll tell you about John, about maybe even his personality type. Is he a quick decision maker? Is he a relationship builder? So we do reconnaissance and we learn as much as we can about the person. So that when we call and we leave a voicemail, it's pretty specific and that person knows you've taken the time to do your homework and that greatly increases the odds that you'll get a few minutes of that person's time and attention. I believe the exact opposite. Like we are like, okay. we are like total spray and pray outbound here. If, so right. we, have, we have 50 callers. If I let all 50 of those callers do 10, 20 minutes of research before they made a phone call, we're never gonna get an appointment for anybody. So if you look at right. a small business owner who's only got, what, two hours a day to do any outbound calling, do they have time to, like, I, I kind of feel like you could make that phone call to the sales rep without doing any of that research, right? Call in, ask for sales, have the exact same conversation, but skip that 10 minutes of trying to figure out stuff on LinkedIn. I guess it depends on the, um, the amount, the dollar amount of the sale and how much trust is involved and how easy it is to make the sale. So if, for example, it's a $30 a month service that you're providing. It's an easy decision to make. That's a numbers mm -hmm. game. You contact enough small business owners and they're gonna catch somebody at the right time who could use those particular services. The more the dollar amount and the more complex the sales situation, the more focused that salesperson needs to be. And then it's worth the time and attention to target market a certain companies of a certain size with certain demographics and certain decision makers 
and put the effort into that research. So I think it's, it could be a both and, but I think it should be tempered with an understanding of how important the decision is. And again, if it's transactional, I'm with you. It's a numbers game. The more people you can touch, the better the odds you'll be in the right place at the right time, and you can make an easy sale. If it's a high trust, high dollar, you got to do some work. I think managed services is be, is a commodity sale now, right? It's not much different than than office supplies or photocopiers. Right? Like you either eat, you either need IT support right now, or you don't need IT support right now. And if you don't need it right now, when will you need it? How are you receiving it currently? What do you like about the provider that you're working with? So on and so forth. Like the best sales call in the world isn't going to make a rational business owner disrupt his company to implement a new IT project, right? They're going to wait until it makes the most sense for their business. They're going to wait until the contract they have with the current provider wears out or wears out ends. And around, I would say around the 90 day mark before that, they're going to consider making a decision. So what do you learn in that research process? without talking to someone that will tell you all of those things. Uh, Steve, maybe you could help me out here and give me a little more context so I could add more value to this conversation. It, and, and what the people listening and what they sell, is it a pretty easy, once somebody wraps their brain around what it is, is it pretty easy for them to say, yeah, I think we'd like this service, or does it require a lot of sales calls back and forth, and it, it's more of a complex discussion? Uh, <clears throat> I would say it's definitely a complex discussion. There are probably some people that can get it closed in uh, just a couple sales calls, but <clears throat> I feel like the average managed service provider is going to need 12 touches before they would ever get a sale. At least. So you're looking yeah. at multi-year engagements. So the average managed services contract now is two to three years in length. And five years ago, there was a little bit of a land grab because everyone was making the move from one business model, which was the break fix methodology of providing support. Now everyone's offering this managed services thing, but it's not a new thing anymore. So there's, it's all displacement selling in this industry now. There's no like, oh wow, what an interesting and innovative idea. It's all like, oh, we already have that. The biggest thing that everybody on this webinar today is gonna come up against is no, we're good or we already have that, or we're happy with the supplier that we're with. And then you're just pretty much waiting them out for two to three years. So I think that comes back to your, your frequent and appropriate and correct style of touch. How do you nurture that lead once they've indicated, okay, we like what you're saying and we're kind of moderately unhappy with the company we're working with now, but we're not going to like, we're not gonna firebomb our company and change IT providers today. We're gonna to work towards creating that relationship. So I think if you, Look at how do you nurture that lead from that initial, okay, now we, we've made contact with them and now you're gonna like flip the switch on your interaction. Like, okay, we need to contact them this many times between you know, today and next year. And then we're gonna be six months away from contract renewal. How do we increase touch frequency to make it make sense? So if you can, like, if you can teach everyone here how to automate that effectively, I think that's the thing that's gonna make them single-handedly the most effective in the market right now. Otherwise you're going to Boy, miss it. I'll bless your pee picking heart. You <laughs> just teed up what I'm most passionate about and that's helping a salesperson get back in the right place finally at the right time with the right positioning and the right personal brand of being kind and considerate and helpful. We teach salespeople that use our technology that when you're in the right place at the wrong time, and in Michael Bosworth's book, so Solution Selling, he says your best clients are already married to someone else, your best prospects, mm -hmm. which means they're in a contract and they're spending a lot of money in these types of services, but they're married to someone else for X amount of time. What we have figured out, and this took me years, and I always thought, what could I have a person send another person to get a different result than just more value proposition literature and emails, because nobody wants to read that stuff. Thank goodness my mom made me read How to Win Friends and Influence People about a hundred times till I got the hang of it. And I figured out in Dale Carnegie's book that I teach salespeople that when they get the bad news, which is, you know, we just signed a contract and we're good for another two years, the salespeople that we train, they say to that person, I can appreciate that. And one of the things that I get thanked for, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, very often by my friends and my clients is I'm always looking for things to help them with their careers. And if I find anything that I think would help you be a better insert purchasing agent, 
business owner, whatever that is, I promise to send that along to you. And somebody says, wow, that would be awfully nice of you. And then using our technology from their phone, they just simply decide which follow-up campaign they want to start. And let's say they were selling to a small business owner, they pick the entrepreneurial campaign. The next day, an email goes out from that salesperson to that prospect that says, I appreciate our discussion yesterday. And as promised, I'm going to look for things to try to help you be a better entrepreneur. Thank you again for your time. Enjoy the day. About a week later, an email goes out from that person to the other person that says, I thought of you when I read this. Somebody's like, oh, well, what is it? They open it up and says, I just ran across this great article called 10 Entrepreneurial Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I wanted you to have this. I hope it helps you. Anything I can do for you, I'm always a phone call away. Enjoy the day. And then the article's pasted below as if they took the time to do it. About a month later, another one goes out. About a month later, a third one goes out, and then they get a phone call reminder that says this person's received three articles on entrepreneurship. Well, what this does is it, it leverages bad timing to the good advantage of the salesperson, and the, it, it builds their personal brand as not being salesy, but being kind and considerate and helpful. That's their personal brand. So it gives the salesperson something to talk about when they call back. And then in the six laws of persuasion, that's the law of reciprocity. So over two or three years, they may have received 18 of these helpful articles. And when that contract comes up, guess who gets called in? My guys. Because they've earned the right to go back by helping the person and not constantly trying to sell. You see, when people know what you do, you don't have to keep reminding them. They get it. And to keep sending them more information about what you do, they don't have the time to read it anymore. They're doing too many jobs. They're spread too thin. So, and if you're curious, does it work? The open rate uh, on any given month, I think last month we pushed out 33,000 emails system-wide. Our open rate was 99.4% because they're not only getting opened, they're getting forwarded to other people saying, hey, this guy sent me this great article or this woman sent me this article and I thought you'd want to read it too. So it absolutely does work. I would say that you could take that even a step further and ask them at that time, what would, like, okay, you're good. I understand that. What would be helpful to you right now? So if you're looking at like the single fastest way to grow your business, that's going to be referrals. It's always going to be referrals. And the only way people are going to bring those referrals to you is if you're engaging in your community, and your circle and bringing leads back to them. So if somebody says to you, well, we're not really worried about IT right now, but you know, we're really, we're looking for a, you know, insert position title here. Like, you know what? I have a great recruiter in my circle. Would you like me to make an introduction to them? Or, hey, I know a guy or whatever. Is there a way that you can help position this company for success in some way? Can you bring that lead back to someone else in your network who then says, oh, thanks very much and interacts with that person and then brings you opportunities? Like, I think every conversation you have is that you get an opportunity to potentially connect more people in your circle. And as your referral network grows aggressively, now all of a sudden people are walking opportunities to your door and you've got a field of sales reps as opposed to it just being you in your office by yourself trying to grow your business. Um, I've noticed in the chat area, everybody, a lot of people are discussing team and team approach. And I think that that's extremely important because in a lot of companies, sales and marketing tend to live in silos and it can almost be antagonistic when I totally agree where it really is, should be one seamless function. And uh, you need some sort of a system where everybody can see what's going on with every relationship. People can add to the information on what they know about the relationships. And it really does need to be a team approach. Now, of course, if you're a tiny company and you're wearing several hats, that's a different discussion for a different day, but it, the sales need to know what marketing's doing. Marketing needs to know what sales doing, and it should be all pulling the same rope the same way at the same time. Yeah, I think a couple of people ask questions about like, hey, what do you do if there is no team? If it's just you, <laughs> it's just you yeah, by yourself. I, I was I was trying to find, I was trying to find a, a a place where I could break in and and you know share some of the questions and comments I've I've seen through here. Sure. Um, so so what do you do if you're just one guy, um, whether it's there's only one person that's handling sales and marketing, or maybe you're just one guy for the whole company, uh, like like me. I'm just I'm just one guy. Taylor IT Group, the group of one. <laughs> so so how how does that person find the time to do everything that that you guys have been talking about, and and how do how do we 
how do we if, if, uh, manage our time effectively to do all of that and support our clients? And I, I went and through a wonderful program called Effective Personal Productivity, and I don't think they, they offer it anymore, but as a small business owner, and at the time I only had like three or four employees, I was sales and marketing, so I can relate to this. And one of the things that each person in their career needs to do is they need to find their best and highest use. What is it you're doing that's difficult for other people to do that you're really good at doing that has a high payoff for you or the company or the result? And when you can identify those two or three things, you should try to spend about 80% of your time in those activities and delegate or outsource everything else you can. I think that's great so, if you've got the revenue to, to do that, right? Like Steve, you and I had a conversation yesterday. Like where we, so let's say you're starting, I know there's lots of people on the webinar today that I know are either just making the move to their own business, they're currently working in IT for another company and they're trying to create their business plan to launch their own MSP. So you're not gonna have the money to outsource to someone else. Like even if it's just like find some guy on Fiverr who can create email templates for you, right? <laughs> and you're not gonna trust, and I, I'm telling you this guys, do not trust an offshore $7 an hour telemarketing firm to make your calls for you. Make them yourself, protect your brand, make sure that you're sending out the best possible interaction. Every, like whether it's an email or a phone call, you always need to protect. Those Pakistani guys are fantastic. It really depends on the market. There's plenty of markets where that will fly, right? But Midwestern U.S. isn't one of them. That's so true. I will tell you, I when, I, when I started, I was working test. out of my living room. And I, and, and I will tell you, when you start a business, there goes your evenings and your weekends if you want to succeed. So I would go out during the day and sell like crazy. And then at night, I'd go home and turn on a Mac and teach myself graphic design and fulfill the orders. And, uh, and then on the evenings, I would read books on business and sales and marketing and educate myself. And I, you know, you get used to 80 hour weeks until you do bring in enough money, um, depending on what you're selling. If you can sell enough services and it creates residual income, that creates freedom for you to take on new skills, for you to can begin educating yourself in other areas of business. So I don't know a shortcut other than you got to grind and you got to grind till you're successful and it requires hours. And consistency. Like sure. I think the biggest challenge for, for anybody starting a business is making the commitment to do something and doing it regularly. So if you get like everybody always leaves stuff like this, like, okay, I'm going to make a hundred calls a day and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then like three <laughs> days later, somebody's server blows up and that's it. They don't do anything for the rest of the week. So if you can create almost a, a regularly scheduled time for you to do your business development activities and honor that the same way that you would honor a client meeting or any sort of important thing that you're doing in your business, if you did, and I'm telling you guys this, if you committed two hours a day to outbound prospecting in any way you wanted to, right? Whether that's I'm gonna make a list of the events in my community that I can go and network in, or I'm gonna make two hours of phone calls, or I'm going to blast out emails to everyone in my network for two hours a day, like whatever it is you wanna do, if you do it consistently, you're not gonna experience feast famine, like okay, my pipeline's full, oh my God, what's happening? No, no business is coming in. Just be consistent with whatever methodology you choose and give it some time to work because people start and they're like, okay, well, I, I've been telemarketing for like three weeks now and I haven't called, closed any business. <laughs> like you need to do it for a year and then you're gonna start seeing results. One thing I would recommend to everyone is the more specific you can get and who you're looking for, the easier it's gonna be for them to find those people for you and make an introduction. So if, for example, you're selling services that are perfect for a company for between, let's say, 10 and 35 employees, tell people that. Do you know any business owner, if that's the decision maker in that case, who manages between 10 and 35 employees? And if you do, would you be kind enough to make an email introduction? I just need 10 minutes of their time. So the more specific you can be, the easier it is for the people that already know you to do a little bit of hunting for you. It seems counterintuitive, but again, the more specific you can be. And when I teach this, I always say, for example, if you're a single man and you're looking to meet a woman and you tell your friends, hey, can you hook me up with somebody? Can I go on a blind date? They just tend to go blank. But if you can say, I'm looking to go out with a Cindy Crawford lookalike. I like dark hair, dark eyes, a nice smile, and a woman who likes a good sense of humor. 
who do you know? They may only know one or two, but it's a perfect fit. So know who you want. Even more specifically, look for trigger events, right? So if you're at a networking event and you're saying like, who do you know that needs IT support? Or who do you know that has a minimum of 20 employees? Like on the spot, people are gonna be like, oh, I don't know, who needs IT support? I don't know. Uh, but if you can think of a trigger event, like who do you know this year that's changing offices? Like now there's a trigger event. That's the perfect time to evaluate new IT companies, right? Like whatever those trigger events, if you can make a list of those and say, now here are the companies that are really good fits for us. And that way you've got kind of this ready-made, here are these action items that I'm looking for versus uh, kind of demanding people think right there and then at the event, like, well, do I know anyone that needs IT support or whether they've got 20 computers or 50 computers? Will, will people know that right off the bat? But they will know what's going on with their companies or their friends' companies, clients' companies. Uh, I've, I've learned that the more specific you can get, um, and this is this is from when I was in BNI. The the more specific you can get, the the more likely that you'll get a referral. So, for example, if I just say I'm looking for another company in Akron, so I can do their IT support, they're they're going to be on like company overload. I don't know which one to give them, but if I say I'm looking for a funeral home that has 30 employees that's in the Akron region and they have their own fleet of limos and what, you know, whatever, whatever stuff you want to come up with. Now, now they're going to start thinking, okay, where did I just go for when Aunt Junie just passed? Did they have all of this stuff and see if they can refer me? And even um, when you were just making that up, I immediately thought of one person I could have introduced you to that I know personally. Oh, who? Uh, <laughs> I don't think they're big enough for you. Barbara. What, what was it? Camfield Hickman. Oh, no. I, I assure you, no one's too small for me, Scott. Well, then remind me <laughs> and I'll make an introduction for you. Well, I appreciate that. Sure. See, look, guys, well, this is why you should come to webinars. <laughs> you can you can get referrals. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, BNI groups, it, it, it is hit or miss, I'll say, with BNI. Um, you got to be in the right group. If you're in a group that's got, uh, you know, Mary Kay and doTERRA and all this other in-home party sales crap and, uh, and, and people that aren't actually in it to help others, they're just going to be selfish, then you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to get much out of it. But if you're in a group that maybe has, you know, the, the, um, financial planner and a copier guy and an internet guy and a phone guy, then now you can start, you know, building a, a nice little power team with these people and figuring out how can you pass referrals between one another. Even though you might be able to do phones, how can you give the phone guy some business so that he, he wants to reciprocate? Because the more you help him, the more he wants to help you. It's not all about you and BNI. It's all there, about them. There's a great book that accentuates that called The Go-Giver. And I would yeah, recommend that people who, need, who want to grow their book of business through their network uh, is always give first. See how much you can give. I'm a big believer in spirituality and karma. And I've also read in many books that um, I believe it was Zig Ziglar, but it really came from the Bible. But if you live your life to help other people achieve their goals, everything you've ever dreamt about will come back tenfold. And I've seen that play out over and over and over in my life, especially if you go into a network event and everybody there is all there for the same thing. They're trying to meet new people and create opportunities. But if you go in there with the attitude and the mindset, I'm going to find a way to help everybody in some way, shape or form with something about their career, their business, their personal development, an introduction. I'm gonna find a way to help this person. People can sense that about you. It actually changes your aura and your persona. And it's just, that makes it so much easier to go into those events knowing you're just gonna help the people that you meet. So, so let's, let's start to take this in a, in a different direction. When it comes to marketing is is there one one thing okay is there one thing that you have found has had great success for you regardless of industry carrie i don't know marketing's a pretty broad brush so 
I mean, we, we built our, we built our business cold calling. We built our clients business cold calling and I own a cold calling company. So I'm kind of invested in the right answer being cold calling, but uh, we have seen content. Like for example, if you can develop content that you can share with your market. So for example, are there associations in the market that you're in that you can provide content for their newsletter? Can you create webinars like this and invite people to them and interact with them in a way that gives them some meaningful information? So I know that there were groups for a while that were doing things like how to protect your kids on the internet. And now it might be like, how do you protect your company from phishing attacks? And how do you, whatever, like for us, we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of stuff like this. Right. So the goal is to lay a foundation so that if, you know, the 50 or 80 people that are on this webinar today are interested in engaging a telemarketing company, hopefully they'll think about us because they saw us on a webinar once. Right. Like that's providing that free content. Can you write articles for your local community publication? Like just even small things. Right? You can find lots of free ways to promote your business. And it takes one phone call to reach an entire association as opposed to trying to call every lawyer in that association, for example. And I guess I'll give you my, um, I think you and I dovetail quite nicely because I'm on a little bit of a different side of the same coin when it comes to marketing. Um, my company doesn't help create new opportunities for our clients. We leverage what's already been done and we put systems in place to improve from that day forward. And it's been my experience in working with people that manage small sales teams that they're using some sort of a CRM or a database type system. And I can tell you, I have yet to, I'll tell you my sales process is four questions about the number one problem we solve. So I will say to someone who has a database, I'll say, open it up and I'll say, pick any letter in the alphabet. So Steve, pick a letter. P. E. Pick any number between one and 10. Six. Let's open up your database and go to the sixth last name that begins with the letter E, and I'm going to ask you two questions. Has that person heard from your salesperson in a meaningful way in the last month? They always no. say, no. Do you have a next touch schedule? No. Do you want to play again? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So what I've discovered is that, and I won't go too deeply into the psychology, but in the platinum rule, we teach that there's four basic behavioral styles, and we teach how to sell to them differently, but... The salespeople who get into outside sales typically are a director relator or a director socializer combination. And it may not be the case in this, in this webinar because we may have a lot of IT people getting into sales and they would be analytical thinkers as a rule. Now an analytical thinker is more process oriented, more patient, more organized, but the typical salesperson that we support is very confident, fast paced, assertive. That's why they get into outside sales and they are terrible at details and routine. That means stopping and typing and entering things into a CRM when there's no payoff. So eventually the relationships will enjoy them go dormant. Our job is to bring all those back to life on behalf of the salesperson as if they were doing those things so that everybody in the database is hearing from the rep in a helpful, meaningful way on a regular basis to get those reps back in the right place at the right time with the right positioning. True story, last Thursday or Friday, I got a call from an old friend of mine out in California. And he, even though he had left this company, they sell uh, hydrostatic type things, hydraulic repair, hydraulic components, things of that nature. And the outside salespeople have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of customers spread all over California. And they have really, they had no way to stay in contact with these people. So they installed my system and it was automatically sending out these helpful articles on how to do preventive maintenance, maintenance on these types of hydraulic equipment and all sorts of helpful tips relevant to the readers. The guy called me and he said, I just talked to a salesman named David. He just got a call from somebody he had totally forgotten about, doesn't even know who the guy is. The guy called him and said, we've been getting your articles for about a year and a half and I need two new power generators. Would you like to quote it? He made a $97,000 sale to somebody who didn't even know who he was by simply staying in meaningful contact. So when I look at marketing now, and I've made the shift from traditional interruption, interrupting advertising to person to person sales support, we now look at marketing as staying in meaningful contact to build your personal brand over time. So you're eventually in the right place at the right time when they finally need what you do. 
that's a different perspective. So this woman can generate leads. I can nurture them for the salespeople until they're sales ready. Okay. Now I I'm gonna I'm gonna have Carrie's uh Carrie's resource that she mentioned in the chat here in just a moment. Um with that said, I would love if we could I don't know if 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 we want to like make one up real quick or or what, but I would love if we could come up with a quick elevator pitch. Oh, it's simple. Super that simple. Any of us IT guys can use. Like, well, at least for calling anyway, it's super simple. It's um where did you go? What have I done here? Ah, <laughs> Are you back yeah. to <laughs> No. Um so I mean the pitch that we use is pretty simple. It's like Hi, this is your name calling from your company name. We are a local IT service provider or a local IT support company. We specialize in working with whatever vertical it is that you're calling into. Who should I speak to to provide a quote for IT support? Like that's the whole beginning of the conversation. And if you don't have any testimonials to back up the vertical that you're calling into, then you're an expert in supporting the size of company that you're calling into. So we focus on working with small businesses that have between 20 and 50 computers. Who should I speak to to provide a quote for IT support? And ending the call that way or ending that sentence that way as opposed to any other way is important because you want to give them an open-ended question that requires a response as opposed to saying, are you interested in IT support or do you need IT support or any of those things? I just ask them, who should you talk to? And ideally at that point, they're either going to say, we already have that, we're not interested, go F yourself, <laughs> hang up the phone, or they're gonna send you to the right person, right? So one of those five things will happen and then you just branch off from there. If they tell you to go F yourself, then you know, get off the phone and move on with your life. And you can sometimes take it actually one step a little bit farther and get to the why to. What is the outcome of what it is that you do? So. If I was providing, you know, IT managed services, I might say to people, I help small business owners sleep better at night knowing that all of their data is protected, all of their equipment is up to date, all of their employees are productive because of the services we provide. Sometimes I'll get somebody to say, well, how do you do that? Or what do you do? And then you can really explain some more details about the services that you provide. And, and wouldn't it be best to explain why you're different? At the beginning, so so that, at the beginning, you just want to get routed to, to no, the receptionist doesn't care. Like her job is just to get you off the phone as quickly as possible. Three other phone lines are ringing. Right? When you get to the decision maker, you're going to have a different conversation. But at that kind of gatekeeper juncture, all they want to do is figure out, do I put this call through or not? And if I do put it through, who do I put it through to? And don't look at it as a you're trying to manipulate or trick. Like don't ever try and trick your way through the initial conversation with a gatekeeper because if the first person you guys are going to hire and i guarantee you the first person you hire is your wife she's going to be the one answering your phone so imagine if i called your company and like totally lied to your wife about why i was calling you imagine how well the conversation between the two of you guys goes afterwards and if i ever get the opportunity to interact with you guys again probably not right like my mother works for me my sister works for me don't try and lie your way into our business like they're going to come talk to me about it. So there's no value in trying to like pretend it's not, is this a sales call? Yes, it is a sales call. It's totally a sales call. That's the only reason you're calling. Don't ever use the word I'm just calling to. No, like you're calling because you want to sell them something. So, so, so what you're saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, is you believe in brutal honesty. I think so. When it, when it comes to that. I think so. Like at some point you're going to, you're, I'd rather get shut down right at the beginning than spend 20 minutes of my time talking to somebody and get shut down then. Right. So if the, and don't assume for a minute that the gatekeeper doesn't know what's going on at that business. Right. So if they say, you know what, we're good, we're happy with the company they have for all, you know, they're the ones who are the single point of contact in their single point of contact contract. And they know exactly what's going on. Maybe they pay the bills, maybe they everything, right? Don't assume that the gatekeeper is just the thing standing in between you and the deal you want. For all you know, that's the person that you have to convince of the value of your services. But first you have to like get to the point where you have earned the right to have that conversation. 
And then to, to your point earlier, like you're going to have to romance that a little bit. You're not going to get the opportunity to pitch day one unless there is an opportunity there day one. But I'm going to say out of every 2,000 calls that we make, we might get a, oh, you know what? Yeah, we are looking for a new IT support company. Thanks. Like, that's great that you called. Like, that might happen one, once a quarter for every client we have. That's still four and a half deals yep. a year. Right. And, and then I take the, the, the other perspective along with that. And this is what I teach salespeople, which is you can be in a room full of, and I'll use, let's say, a small, 20 small business owners that have of the exact size number of employees that, uh, that use service. They're ideal prospects for you. And I would say to the salespeople, if you go talk to all 20 of them, how many are looking for what you do the day you meet them? And I get the typical answer. If I get really lucky, one, and if it's an amazingly great day, maybe two. I go, okay, well, what do you do with the other 19? They're qualified for what you do. Why don't you nurture them in a way, knowing that they're a qualified prospect, but you met them on the wrong day. That's why it's important to learn about them and find things that genuinely help them so that eventually they can't wait to call you because they actually like you more than they do their existing provider and all things being equal, people do business with people they like and trust. That's true. Especially in this, like in this particular cell where there is so much of a, like people don't see the difference between IT support provider and IT support provider, right? In their minds, like they do already, whether you are the best IT company in the world or whatever like they don't see a difference between what you do and the thing that they're already buying what they will see a difference is in their relationship with you liking you trusting you finding you interesting finding you to be the person that they are coming to to ask questions when their current provider might be falling down on the job a little bit right like you want to become i hate this word but i'm going to say it anyway you want to become that trusted advisor so those articles that you were talking about like that's how you do that like this guy knows yes, everything. He's super smart. How helpful. Well, Carrie, when um interestingly, because you live in Vegas, and one of the speeches my co-author and I used to do out in Vegas was called Forget Branding, Support Sales. And we would attract 30 marketing executives who would come into that meeting and just sit there <laughs> glaring at us like this, wondering where are you going with this? And our point was there are two types of brands in this world. There's a corporate brand and there's a personal brand. And when you can support salespeople in such a way to where from the prospect's point of view that they come across as organized, kind, considerate, helpful, connected, there's this thing in gestalt perception called closure. So if I do this, everybody says, oh, you're making an O. And I go, nope, look closer. They're not touching. But our mind has this need to close things. And when a prospect sees a salesperson staying in meaningful contact, treating them the way they wanted to be treated, following up and following through in a way that was consistent with the request, going out of the way to find things to help them, in their mind, they think, whoever hired and trained that girl or that woman or that man, that company must be awesome. Because now the behavior of the salesperson, we're creating the corporate brand through the personal brand of the person interacting with the other person. Now we're waiting for you, Steve. Now we're waiting for you, Steve. I know. Um, I'm, I'm answering a question that somebody asked me about. Um, so, someone asked, how much does Carrie charge? $6,000 a month. And uh, reasonably, <laughs> um, for some. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know what? Now, I want you guys to all like wait like till the end of the year, because we have been trying and trying and trying. Like we've tried, I wanna say three different types of lower, I don't wanna say lower value, but lower cost solutions. We have been trying to find something that would be one, so that we aren't the biggest marketing line item on everyone's <laughs> bill payment. Uh, and two, we wanna find something that's useful to the companies that I think genuinely require our services, but can't afford them, right? The companies that can afford our services probably can do this on their own if they really want to. So how do we find something that's universally appealing, that's affordable, that still actually produces results? Like that is a very challenging thing to do. It's not that we don't want to offer a less expensive solution. We haven't found one that produces enough results to even warrant the thousand dollars or the two thousand dollars that we could charge. We've tried it and we can't we can't do it at that rate. 
right? We end up with a couple of clients, we test it out, maybe it goes really well in one market and every other market bombs. We just haven't been able to find anything. And like, quite frankly, I'm in this to make money, so I want my margins, I wanna keep my margins, but I wanna give you guys something valuable too. If I ever find that thing, you better believe I will splash it all over the internet the minute we come up with it. We just aren't there yet, but I'm working on it. So I'm, I'm looking at your site and I see there's a services page because you do more than just the sales appointment set. That's true, we do. So, so the, the question as to what you charge was actually for call answering, not for outbound. Oh, we don't actually do that. <laughs> but it says you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carrie, you know, Carrie I, I know this guy, his name's Steve. He's fantastic at web development. <laughs> we actually work with a web developer. It's not that we don't do it. We just like, we, we came up with the idea like a year and a half ago and we started pitching it to people and nobody bought it. So we just never pursued it any further. Like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, will you do that? Yeah, of course. If I can make money off it, I'm gonna do it. We just don't aggressively offer that service. And every time we pitch it, people are like, I can get that overseas for $100 a month. They're like, yeah, go buy it from them. That's cool. Yeah, the last thing I want is somebody to call my company and to get the thing that nobody likes. When they call tech support, What's what's the one thing people don't want to talk to? Anyone overseas, foreign, yeah, right? it's it's yeah. unfortunate because we've had people Canadians apply that are great. like we've had people apply to work with us in telemarketing roles that I should be working for, right? They they were educated, they were foreign educated, they came to the U.S. and they worked for Microsoft in Dubai for twenty years. Like they are people I should be working for, and since they sound like they are not from North America because they are not. I can't even hire these people to help me telemarket. And they know far more about like, they know far more about everything than I do. It's just unfortunate that the immediate perception when it comes to somebody who is a foreign language speaker is that it's just negative. The, the feedback is negative. You guys are gonna think I'm goofy, but I actually enjoy getting telemarketed to because uh, there's usually only several outcomes. Number one is one in a million, somebody's gonna be actually really good and I want to learn from them. What, how, what did they do to get my attention? What did they say coming out of the gate? How, where, where did they get their training? It doesn't happen very often, but then a lot of times I, I kind of like a good verbal joust. So I'll just start trying to sell them something just to watch them squirm. But then lastly, I know what doesn't work. And I will tell you when I get cold called from someone with a foreign accent so thick, I can barely make out the product or service. I just tell them in a very kind way, you're probably very good at what you do, but I can't work this hard to figure out what it is you're trying to help me do. And I just can't give them any time or attention. It's exhausting. Yeah, I would agree that that's very challenging. I love getting sold too. Like I like, I'm not even allowed to take sales calls anymore. <laughs> I'll buy anything. <laughs> really? No, like I, I genuinely enjoy people. Like no, that's why I, I said earlier, nobody calls me. So we have, I wanna say, 30 MSPs that we work for, you know how many have asked me for my business? Two. Like 30. Well, Steve, am I making a fair assumption that a lot of the people who go out and are selling these particular services come from the IT industry and they tend to be analytical thinkers, very intelligent, uh, like to work by themselves, but not necessarily people oriented, more process oriented? Well, what do you guys think? Does does that match your description? It it matches. I don't know. I, I'm I'm that way, but I'm also left-handed. So so I am also uh, not that way. If well, that makes sense. If you just watch Carrie speak, she's very direct, very confident, very assertive, very fast-paced. There's an old saying that says salespeople are the easiest people to sell to, and I can explain why. A vast majority I wish of sales. I could talk to everyone like Carrie. Hey, I'm wearing a mermaid costume. <laughs> I was gonna bring it up, but I was afraid you'd hurt me. <laughs> it's over. My husband just said, "But the reason finish them." Carrie, the re the reason that you're easy to sell to is because you're more direct than indirect. And direct people are very confident and assertive, and as soon as they see something they want, they just buy it. Yeah. And, and quite often, if you're more socializer than director like I am, you tend to have buyer's remorse because as soon as it feels good, you buy it. And I tend to buy like two of everything because I forgot I already bought <laughs> the book or the CD. And I just buy it on the spot. 
Let's talk um, about how Amazon yeah. Prime is ruining my visa. <laughs> I went out to buy a new car and by pure coincidence, the salesman happened to be what's called a relator behavioral style, very soft-spoken, very patient. It took him about three minutes of not speaking to let me sell the car to myself. And when he was done writing up the order, I gave him one of the books I wrote on the four styles. I circled his style, I circled mine, and I said, man, did you get lucky? And then the owner of the dealership came over. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm giving this guy a book. He accidentally sold me a car, and he doesn't know why. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? I said, he never spoke the whole time I bought the car, called my wife and told her I bought her a car, because I was the best salesman in the conversation. You sold it right to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, and then I turned around and I sold the owner of the dealership $22,000 worth of sales training. <laughs> That's a fair exchange, I think. That is too funny. I almost got the car for free. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Now, um, you, you mentioned that he was a relator. So that means he was how... very quiet, cooperative, easygoing, soft spoken. Uh, very indirect, which means he dropped eye contact. He never interrupted. He was a good listener. Um, very people oriented. When he did ask me questions, they were relevant. How are you? Who's going to use the car? What's important to them? In this case, it was my wife. Um, so a uh, relator, uh, very quickly, there's only two dimensions of someone's observable behavior. This is why I love the platinum role. Before I uh, partnered up with Dr. Alessandra, I had learned DISC, I'd learned social styles, I'd learned ENFP, the Enneagram, Myers-Briggs. The platinum role was so easy, I could learn it and teach it in 30 minutes. Then basically all you're paying attention when you're talking to someone and getting them talking is two dimensions of their behavior, their speed, how fast they talk, how confident and assertive, or how slowly they speak and how calmly they speak. So that's a level of assertiveness or pace or directness. And then you combine that with where they focus the conversation or their level of warmth. So picture there's a dashboard on everybody's forehead, speed and temperature. That's all I pay attention to. So if someone is very guarded, which means they're cool, they're standoffish, they're hard to read, they don't give you a lot of facial expression, their primary focus is going to be facts and data and business and things, not people and relationships. If they do a lot of smiling and they're very friendly and they're open and they share things with you, that means they're more open than guarded and they'll tend to make decisions more emotionally than intellectually and they don't mind a little chit chat before you turn the conversation to business. So if you combine where someone is comfortable with their level of warmth in the conversation with how quickly they speak or how cooperative and quiet and introverted they are, and you adapt to those two dimensions, that lowers interpersonal, uh, it lowers interpersonal tension and increases trust and it makes it much easier for people to stay in conversations with you and in selling, it's like cheating. Uh, the Platinum Rule for Sales Mastery, we wrote that 10 years ago it was just voted again top 50 sales books in the world again this year because it teaches salespeople that one skill of adapting to observable behaviors and making it easy to walk someone through the five phases of a good sales conversation. And it absolutely works. Hmm. I like that. I feel like I should read that book. I sent you a free copy as you'll recall. I know. <laughs> and if, uh, if anybody wants to send me an email and uh, you would like a free copy, I'll send you a free e-version just for your time and attention today. Send me an email. It's Scott with two T's at saleselevator.com and just put in the subject line. Uh, let's see. I want something that makes me feel better about myself. Put in the subject line, Scott, you're awesome because you're humble. Yeah, that'll do it. And then I'll send you a book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's my favorite bumper sticker i'm awesome because i'm humble <laughs> that is wow um and and just because now's a great time to do it i just uh clicked a couple buttons to start sharing uh contact information and website information for scott and carrie so that way if you guys would like to reach out to them to discuss any of this stuff further uh, i'm sure they will do so for a nominal fee now, uh, let's go to, let's, hmm. I, I feel like there's, there's more questions that people asked. Uh, it looks like you answered questions about pricing because you're awesome. And uh, 
Zach is having the same struggle coming up with the cybersecurity solutions for small businesses. You know, I'll, I'll agree. There are, there are some services that you just can't figure out how to sell for a low price. But should um, you be, so, so, I mean, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. There's something to be said about lowering your prices when you're trying to grab market share. But eventually what you're doing is sh you're screwing five years from now, Steve, when you do that, because at some point you're going to have to go back to all those clients and raise your prices. So it is not any harder in my experience. Like the reason I charge what I charge is because I can. Right? Like there's what regarding, is this more regarding a price sensitivity on the part of the buyer? Um, I, I think so. Do you, do you have any words of wisdom on that? I've, I have learned very quickly when I'm talking with a prospect, if they start becoming real sensitive to price, I just turn the fire hose back on them. And I'm like, tell me a little bit about your services. And they start bragging about their services. I'm like, well, where are you priced in relation to the market? And they'll say, well, we're towards the upper end. And I go, well, how, how are you able to do that? And they say, well, we're really great at what we do. We have outstanding customer service. We hire the best employees. And I say, isn't it surprising what you and I have in common? I like that. I like that a lot. I'm going to use that. And, and right away, that's called commitment and consistency of the six laws of persuasion. That one's like cheating. So when I get someone to tell me what they value and I say, that's interesting, I value that too. How are they not gonna pay for what it is they say they sell? Good luck with that. I think I like the, the I like that. Like I kind of think like you can use that as a, almost spin it into, I can do it cheap or I can do it right. Like you can go with the lowest well, bidder if you want, but I know what it costs to fulfill our service in a way that's going to bring value to your business. And if they're on the lower end pricing of their industry or profession, I don't care anyways, because they're going to be out of business in three years. So it's not a prospect for me. And when, the, when it's in terms of building a solution together, and then at the very end, we get to the price discussion and they want to start negotiating that down. I'll just say, well, which of these do you want me to start stripping out? And I'll be happy to do so. To get it down to whatever budget you have in mind, I'll start pulling things out of the solution. No, I like that approach as well. I mean, I think a lot of MSPs are moving towards that set price. Like, this is what we do. This is what we charge. And I really like, I look at a lot of the MSPs on our roster that are doing exceptionally well, and they don't have exceptions. Like, you cannot scale an exception. You can't offer 27 different packages and be an efficient managed service provider. You know, you offer one thing, and if the client doesn't want to buy that one thing, then they aren't the right client for you because your goal long-term is scalability. And in order to scale your IT company, you have to be offering something that you can replicate effectively over and over and over again, right? So if you're selling 17 different backup solutions, how are you going to replicate your offering using economies of scale and using you know the best technology that you can and using people that understand that technology instead of trying to hire people that understand 17 different things right like you you create building blocks and then you scale if we sell one thing we sell well i mean according to our website we sell like eight things but really we sell like one thing we sell a six thousand dollar cold calling package and all we do is swap out the name of the MSP and swap out the city. And it's the exact same thing over and over again, which means anybody in my company can step in to any campaign in my company. Right? Like, so churn doesn't hurt us. Scalability is there. So everyone said, oh, you can't scale telemarketing. Yes, you can. You can scale anything except exceptions. But, and one thing I would like to get out before we run out of time mm -hmm. is, uh, Abe Lincoln said, if you gave me six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening my ax. And for anybody who's in professional sales, if I were you, and I can't say this strongly enough, your lunch hour should be with a sandwich and a book every single day, because you are the tool, you are the ax. And the more you learn, the more resources you gather, the more value you can bring to any relationship, and I'm not bragging, but for 25 years, I have read more books than just about anybody I know. And when I go in and I talk to a small business owner, I know I'm going to have something to help that person. And once I've found a recommended a book or sent it as a gift or recommended a resource, I now have liking and trust. And now we can really talk about a solution. So what I've figured out is that 
if you have products and services that are pretty much commodities and the company isn't differentiated, you can be differentiated. You can become the kind of person, here's what I tell salespeople, if you become great at what you do, every sales call you go on is a job interview. And you wanna be so good that everybody that talks to you tries to hire you out from your company. Because whatever you just did to them, they want you doing to your prospects, to their prospects. So you are the tool, your future is you. In an hour a day, it's surprising what you can learn in three to five years in an hour a day. It's been said that if you read one hour a day on any subject, one subject in three to five years, you'll be a world's leading authority in that subject. And one quick story about that, I was training a team of uh, software salespeople in Dallas, Texas. I had sent them a copy of my book a month ahead of time, and halfway through the first day, I realized not one person had read the book. Called the president of the company in, and I asked him, how much do these people make on average? And he said $85,000 a year. And I looked at those people and I said, you know, you guys understand that what I know about psychology and automating follow-ups and all the things I do, if I, you gave me three years to build a territory, where would my sales be in relation to your sales? And they all averaged, they said, well, probably about double. I looked at the president, I go, what would my compensation be? And he says 140,000 a year. And I said, okay, that's 55,000 a year more I'm gonna earn than you people because I read a book and you don't. I didn't graduate high school, I didn't graduate college, but I read an hour a day every day and I've been doing so for 25 years. So over a 40 year career, you're leaving $2.2 million on the table because you're too lazy to read during lunchtime. Call your spouse and tell them because you're lazy, their kids aren't going to better schools, they're not driving better cars and you're not living in better houses. Read. Man, that like hurts. Yeah. <laughs> that, that hurts. I have zero tolerance for training lazy people. Zero, none. Oh man, I feel like I need to go read a book and make. Some I can't. Calls I can't be the wind and the rudder. I, I can't do both. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that uh, my brain hurts. Uh, <laughs> but wouldn't, it be nice, right, no. wouldn't it be nice to be able to go into a sales conversation knowing you can read their buying style and the mode they're in and knowing you can effortlessly adapt to that person to make it comfortable for nice. them, knowing that you can accurately predict when and how that person wants and needs to make a decision, knowing that you've got six laws of persuasion in your back pocket and you can use them effortlessly to get the answer that you wanted to get. Why wouldn't you want to go into every sales call being able to do those things? When you say it like that, there, there's no reason for me to not want to go into any any situation at all without being able to read people and understand them better. If I were in professional selling for 40 years, I would be really tired always bringing a knife into a gunfight. I just don't get into fights. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way, the way I, I love it, if my product or my service is going to help that person or that company, mm -hmm. I would be doing them a disservice if I didn't have 15 different ways for them to come to that understanding. I don't want them buying somewhere else because we're better. And I have to help you understand that. That's my job. So, so we, we talked about um, the, the, the one thing that works best in marketing. Is there one thing that you guys feel works best when it comes to trying to get in front of people to sell? Is it, please don't tell me it's cold calling because that's the thing I hate the most. What do you, I own a cold calling Which company. Why everyone should just give Carrie six grand. <laughs> you, know what? you shouldn't. So let's, let's dispel that myth right now. The best thing that you could do for your business would be to learn how to do it yourself create the process, perfect it, and then train somebody coming up behind you on the process that you perfected. That is the best case scenario. It's going to be long-term, the most effective for your business because you will understand the sales process intimately, which means that when somebody comes into your business and screws you around for six months, you know that won't happen anymore because a month in, you'll understand based on the KPIs that you're measuring that this person isn't doing their job correctly. Part of the issue that I see is people want somebody else to solve the problem for them, right? So whether that's, I'm going to hire this like hotshot salesperson that's not working. Like, why is this hotshot salesperson unemployed and coming to work for your shitty MSP? They're like, why? Why would that ever happen? I left my very lucrative sales role to come for work for a one-man shop in Ohio. 
It doesn't happen. Good salespeople aren't looking for jobs very often. So you kind of get what you get. And if you have a process that you can train them to, you can turn that person into a hugely valuable asset for your business. But most of the time, great salespeople aren't wandering around looking for their next career move with a company that's smaller than the company that they came from, right? So you get these kind of fast talking, like if I can't sell you to on hiring me, how can I sell anything, right? So they sit down and they wow you and you don't bother to check the references because they're a little bit less expensive than the other 17 guys that hire, that you interviewed with. You hire this guy and then six months later, not only have you developed no new business, but you've just spent $30,000 on a sales guy that did nothing for you. And that happens because Absolutely. you don't understand the process. Actually, my uh, co-author, Dr. Tony Alessandra, has a company called assessments247.com. And this is a fact. You can pre-test uh, potential salespeople for both personality fix and values and motivators and find exact matches for the job description before they ever get their first paycheck. Um, we did a case study, uh, another co-author, Don, Don Hudson, uh, did a case study with five car dealerships down in Memphis, Tennessee. And they used these online assessments to weed out potential salespeople before they came onto the car dealership. And they discovered that there was two combinations that work perfectly. People with a very direct, dominant style, just like Carrie, the director, very confident, assertive, but their values and their motivators was they were very altruistic, which means they liked helping people. Those salespeople outsold unfiltered salespeople by 280% their first three months, and their reduction in turnover dropped by a full third over the course of a year. So there are ways to filter salespeople using science and not guessing. Yeah. Because those people can interview, they're great at interviewing, but are they built for the job? Hire people who are naturally built to succeed in that sales environment. And it can be tested. But if you're looking at a lead generation or telemarketing role, somebody that's just setting appointments for you. We discovered that when we profiled. We took a, we hired a profiling company and we profiled everybody in our company and we took our top performers. We overlapped their personality profiles to see where they were consistently um, the same. And what we learned was that salespeople do really poorly as lead generators. Like it's just not the same personality at all. So we don't we don't incent our callers. There's no variable comp for our lead generators. They all make a salary. They all have benefits. They all have paid vacation. They have a paid lunch. They have paid coffee breaks. They want to come into work at eight and they want to go home at four. They don't check their email outside of uh, business hours. There is absolutely no responsibility for anyone in our company after 4 p.m. unless you're on the executive team. You go home and you're finished. Right. So uh, there is absolutely no reason that they should ever schedule a crappy appointment. But what we're focusing on is data integrity. So if you go back to that nurturing process that you were talking about, like what we're doing is making sure that all, all the data that we need to make sure that no opportunities slip through the cracks over the next, you know, never mind the next three quarters, let's talk about the next three years. You should know what everybody in your market is doing. If your telemarketers or your lead generators are doing their job correctly, all the data is at your fingertips. You should be able to slice and dice by, here is every comp here's every contract renewing in my market in January of 2018, and I'm gonna to market to them based on that. Here's every company that ever said they were interested in backup. Here are the companies that are interested in security. Now you should be able to finally hone that marketing pitch using an automated tool like the one you're talking about based on those um, pieces of data. But if you're salespeople, and salespeople are notoriously bad at collecting data, they just want the win. The personality profile of a sales rep is like, I don't care whether there's only three of the four things. I want the win. I'm going to do this. So you don't want that in a lead generator. You don't want, I don't want to send my clients who are paying that enormous amount that you keep mentioning, Steve. Thank you. Um, I don't want them ever driving an hour across town to go to a shitty meeting that shouldn't have been on their calendars. So I don't want to incent my callers to skip steps in the process. I want to incent them to do all the work as accurately as possible. I think you and I find ourselves in violent agreement. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> now go put on your Halloween yeah. costume. Well, let's go out. <laughs> there you go. Um, everyone that's that's still here with us, are there any final questions? I see one. What's the best tool to generate leads? I, I, I typed in here, try anything and everything and keep test, you always test, measure and adjust, test, measure and adjust, test, measure and adjust, try everything you can 
And when it starts working, you just decide, is the ROI worth it or not? We just buy shitty lists. Is it lists. worth either my time? <laughs> we, we buy like shit lists on the internet, right? Like we just buy like Dun & Brad Street lists. Every list you buy online is going to be 30% garbage. So just, yeah. Are you serious? You just buy Yeah, we start with a Dun & Brad Street list. Okay. We strip out anything that isn't technology dependent, technology strategic. We strip out everything that is a subsidiary, anything that's publicly owned. We strip out government because I have no interest in calling trucks to find RFPs that are never going to be won. Uh, we strip out anything that isn't um, one person to one computer type industry. So we don't call into transportation, we don't call into retail, we don't call into restaurants. We call into professional services primarily. And then you build it based on number of employees. Don't build your list by revenue because unless the revenue has been confirmed by the company, they won't include that in your list poll. So if you try and pull a list of every company between a million and five million, for example, if the company hasn't verified their revenue, it'll just drop all those leads out. You won't have them. So a better, a better way to buy your list is by number of employees. Those will be more accurate, but you're still going to have 30% of wrong business, wrong number, out of business. That person never worked there, blah, blah, blah. Just buy the cheapest, grungiest list that you can, and then it's your job to make that into useful data. So what about uh, Dun and Brad Street, Kevin? If if I recall correctly, D and B is. Uh, oh, they're also like the the credit. The uh, why can't I think of the term? They're like the Equifax of business. You can get them for free at the Isn't library. Like if you don't want to spend money on a list, honestly though, building lists at the library yeah. is an enormous pain in the ass, and you've got better things to do. Like spend your. $300 and buy your list. Don't, don't go to the library to pull a free one unless you have all the time in the world or you have kids, we'll do it for you. Kids are Man. not. Until they're not. Until they're not, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, what, what, where, where do you go for prospecting? Is that lead uh, LinkedIn? Um, well, okay, here's the problem I think, and this ties back into my uh, refusal to do research. Like the only research I need to do when I'm calling is have a second monitor up and four rings is plenty of time for me to find everything that I want to know about the company I'm calling into. LinkedIn is okay. So you don't spend a lot of time. No. I want to know that you're the right industry and the right size. Everything else I think can be done in five minutes on the phone. You get the gatekeeper on and the phone. And where do you find... Where, where do you find that information? Just go to their website? Or we buy the list. We import the list place. into a CRM. Um, you can't base size off Google. You have to actually buy a list that's been segmented by, like you'd have to go in, put the SIC codes in that you want. Put the, sorry, I was just answering a question on the side. Um, Info USA you can buy from, or you can, I think Resource USA is. Josh, what's the name of the library list? Ref oh, Reference uh, USA. Reference USA? There's two of them. So the Las, the Las Vegas library has the shittier one, right? I think it's the better one. Or the better one. There's two of them. Reference USA and A to Z. Reference USA or A to Z.com. So there's two different lists and different libraries subscribe to different ones. So you have to have the one that we subscribe to, you actually have to go into the library and download the list, which I'm not doing. <clears throat> I've got a, a little bit of a different angle on the same idea here. If you made me go out tomorrow and start selling these types of services here in Northeast Ohio, my first 150 sales calls would be to corporate attorneys and corporate accounting services. And so I would be going after the golden geese and not the golden eggs. So the golden egg is one small- I would much rather the golden geese. So it takes me just as much time to build liking and trust with an accountant as it does with a small business owner. And once that accountant likes me and trusts me and understands what I do, guess who has the ear and the trust of a uh, hundred small business owners at accounting firm. Yeah. So, so what I might do is I might number one say, could I for free install my system in your firm so you can see it work and you can experience working with me and my team if I had to, or at a great discount. And then I would continue to build my personal brand with that accountant or that attorney by sending things to help him or her with their practice. I would try to give them referrals. I would treat that person like gold because that person could literally hand me 80 clients over the next 10 years. Yeah, I think that's phenomenal. If you can get people bringing the business to your door, 
Never make another when, cold when call you're, again. When, you're, when your attorney or your accountant says to you, oh, I didn't know that was an issue for you. Would you mind if I introduce you to Steve Taylor? Steve's not going to be doing a lot of selling when he walks in my office. The trust is implied. That's very true. So, Scott, I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, I got a hard stop in about now, eight minutes. No, that's that's fine because we're we're gonna start wrapping up here anyway. Um, so, so I actually I'm gonna I'm gonna click this little button that that the three of us have access to. It's called Go Backstage. I, I can I um, can I quickly address something the DM just said that he's got a standing offer that anyone that gives him a referral they get a month's billing for free, I think. Is that, am I reading that correctly? I, I think what I'm, what I'm understanding is if you were that. to refer a business to me, I would give you the first month. Basically. Okay. Can I, I offer a suggestion? Um, yeah. I don't know how much a month, how much a month costs, but number one, the small business owner, the purchasing agent or something will never see or miss that money. I would, I would rather see somebody spend $20 and buy a very thoughtful book for that person or do something that's permanent that reminds them that you said, thank you. Uh, Tony Alessandra taught me that in business, if you make a mistake, whatever you send to apologize, make sure they can eat it or it's dead within three days because <laughs> you don't want them to remember the mistake. But if it's by way of thanking someone, make sure that it's permanent and it's thoughtful. So if someone gave me a referral, I would find out what they're interested in, whether I'm interested or not. And I would send them a very thoughtful gift and a handwritten note that says, thank you. I, I got in with Steve Taylor. We're doing business together. I appreciate you. And I'll go one step further. I've taught salespeople that if that's a small business owner who's giving you that referral, you don't send him the gift. You send two movie tickets and a gift certificate to their favorite restaurant and $20 in cash to his wife with a note that says, Steve gave me a referral. I know he works hard. You two deserve a night out together on me. And now she'll be in his ear for the next six months. Who else can you be referring to Scott? That is freaking gold. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I'm the most manipulative person you'd ever meet, <laughs> but I always do it in a way that so, helps people. So <laughs> well, the, $20, oh, the $20 was for the babysitter, by the way, that's what the 20 was for. The, the gift certificate is for the, uh, the restaurant and then the two movie tickets. So then you also pay for the babysitter. Because chances are he's working a lot of hours if he's running a small company. She doesn't see him very often, and I can't help it. But that's just the way my brain works. And and that's perfect because because Kevin's right. She's going to nag him or me or whoever uh, because she wants that night out again. Because she's so excited that she got a night out finally. Yep, it cost me one hundred and twenty dollars, and I now have a golden goose who's motivated. That's amazing. So um, I know that that what uh who was that dm yeah dm so what he's saying is uh if if you were to, to <laughs> go out and get a, a client from me or whatever i would then give you let's say that client pays me a thousand a month i would then give you a thousand dollars cash but that's not going to be as memorable to you oh my gosh for a thousand dollars you could find out what i'm passionate about Let's say it's golf. You could have bought me a custom set of golf clubs. And every time I tee up, who do I think about? And who am I telling my buddies about? Hey, you see these new ping zings? My buddy Steve Taylor bought them for me. This guy's awesome. And by the way, do you know anybody who needs what he does? Make it permanent. Right, I'm sorry. I'm not going to buy you a gun, Kevin. <laughs> 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 so many reasons that's not happening. Um, that That's an awesome idea. So So what you're saying is, Give them a gift that that they will keep forever, whether the value of that gift is 120 or 1,000. It needs to be a it's gift the that they will use for a long time. Yeah, and a matter of fact, if it gets to be too pricey, it could almost come across like a bribe. And and I have thought, I have, it's been my experience that if you do a little recon, so for example, if I don't know the guy very well, I might actually call his wife, introduce myself and say, when he's not working, what does he love doing? And then when that gift or that book shows up, he's like, how the heck did you know that? And one thing about how to win friends and influence people is that everybody wants to feel important. And when you show the other person that they were so important that you took the time to learn about them and do something special for them, you not only have a client, you're well on your way to having a friend. 
And one of my favorite sayings I learned from my buddy Ed Nolan that says, if you want to make a new friend, find a way to help him with his health, his wealth, or his family. And I try to do things in all three areas for the people that I meet. That is awesome. Carrie, do you have any final words of wisdom? I just need to know where DM li lives because if he's local, we're getting a beer. Oh, actually, uh, Carrie, I've got a all question. Right. Um, I, I hear you have a, a, like a really successful MSP. <laughs> I saw that on the Discord channel, which I didn't know existed, thankfully, because there goes my entire life. And somebody said, did you know MSP Carry had an MSP? I do not. I have a fake MSP called Everywhere Managed, and I use it to train my callers so that nobody gets the new guy. But somebody once asked a question on Reddit about websites, and I'm like, oh, well, here's my MSP website address. It's always promoting vertical action who designs our websites. And anyway, I don't have an MSP. I mean, I have a MSP website, but it. <laughs> so wait, Everywhere Managed is a vertical mm -hmm. action site? Man, this looks Yeah, it looks great. It took them not even two days to put that up. All the, they supplied all well, the content, funny, they built all of it. I don't, I don't even know what's on that website. <laughs> what's funny is mine is a, a vertical action website too. And every time I see someone else's vertical action website, I'm always like, man, theirs looks so much better. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's not because mine doesn't look good i just always get jealous of other people's yeah but call brian and, and like talk to him about what you want brian will hook you up uh, oh i know Steve, brian, Steve, I, 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 took a, twice. I took a cursory look at your website my initial reaction was extremely positive if you want i'll put some time into it and if i see anything working against you i'll let you know but my first blush was yours is very good well, thank you. My, my website is done by Vertical Action. Um, and I'll, I'll put that here in the chat. So so it's it's a great service. And I think it's what, a 100 bucks a month, Carrie, something like that. I mean, it's, I mean, it seems expensive, but it's really not unreasonable considering they blog like every single day for me and I've got a sharp open site. So all right, guys, it is almost 2.30. I'm going to stop it right here. Um, I'm going to pop a link in the, in the chat here. If anyone would like to join me for a little, uh, after party, feel free to pop in that zoom room. It is going 24 hours a day now. And I hope you all have a, have a great day. Great week, Scott, Carrie, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you and your time. Um, I, I hope something awesome is able to come to you guys because of it. And all I know is I've got 10 emails and everybody's telling me I'm awesome because I'm humble. So this is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't, after, after what I, uh, after what I've heard from Carrie, I don't care what she charges. She provides every penny in value just from what I've heard today. I can tell. So, all of you have a great day. Thanks again so much, guys. And uh, I will see you all next week. Thanks, Steve. All right, see you.